Hey everyone, how's it going? So you guys really seem to like the last video where I tried to beat Pokemon Red and Blue, but my opponents all had level 100 Pokemon. So we're going to be doing the exact same thing, but in Pokemon Gold and Silver. I would pick Crystal, but it has the Move Tutor, making it slightly easier. And you know me, I want to pick the hardest version for this challenge. The rules are simple, no items in battle, set mode, all the classic rules, but we also aren't allowed to go above level 50. The game is not modified in any way other than the fact that all my opponents have level 100 Pokemon, and so we can use level 50 Pokemon, but if they level up during the battle, we have to reset. So we gotta be really careful, and that means we're gonna use a bunch of different Pokemon. Now, normally I would just fast forward to where we battle Faulkner, but Youngster Mikey's level 100 Pidgey and Rattata are going to be a little more difficult than a level 100 Weedle. Having said that, for the most part, Generation 2 Trainer Pokemon just have the last four moves they learn via level up, so Pidgey only has one attacking move. Any attacking move would do enough to knock me out, but because Pidgey isn't attacking, we were able to poison it with Chikorita and then just kinda hope that it doesn't attack at all, and we knock it out. Everything gains 227 experience points, which is great. But now out comes the level 100 Rattata. And this thing has Super Fang, which is what we really want to see, and Hyper Fang, which we don't. Now Super Fang, regardless of level, always will just take away half your HP rounded down. In other words, Rattata only has two attacking moves, Pursuit and Hyper Fang. Unfortunately, that was enough to knock me out, and so we're going to probably have to do this quite a few times and get a little lucky. Well, it's taken three hours of in-game time, but finally we're going to beat Youngster Mikey. Notice we already have Bayleaf because every time I would lose, I wouldn't reset because experience points are valuable. Pidgey, again, isn't too difficult. You just don't want it to use Wing Attack and we can lower its accuracy. Notice that we have Butterfree as well, because Butterfree has confusion, and the hope is, although it doesn't happen here, is that Butterfree would confuse Rattata and it would damage itself, which would be much quicker. Instead, what we have to do is put it to sleep, and then we use Sand Attack with Pidgey. Of course, everything about the strategy is incredibly luck-based, from putting it to sleep to then poisoning it, and then finally, I'm going to spam Razor Leaf. The Growl was actually a mistake because Pursuit wouldn't be affected by that. We can attack, although it makes very little difference. And thankfully, due to all the accuracy drops and the poison, we were able to knock out Rattata and get by, thankfully, the only mandatory trainer, although I accidentally immediately run into Youngster Joey, that you need to battle before Falconer. Or, as I accidentally bump into Youngster Joey, I should say, before Falconer's Gym. Birdkeeper Abe is often annoying in these challenges with his level 9 Spearow, but at level 100, it's even worse. Additionally, Birdkeeper Abe has two attacking moves, Pursuit, as well as Drill Peck, and so far, it has gone two for two. It's unlikely Abe has any kind of good or special AI causing it to attack, but I realize I probably need a bit of a different strategy, so I reset. Now, I was told this, and someone who knows the inner workings of Gen 2 can confirm it, maybe? Abe always attacks. So how in the world are we going to defeat him? The answer is spend 27 in-game hours, I am not kidding, and building up a completely new team including a level 34 Noctowl. Now, Spearow seemed to always use the move that knocked me out, but in this case it used Pursuit for some reason, which meant that level 34 was actually overkill. But yes, the idea was to swap in Haunter, which knows Curse, and then try to tank Pursuit with Graveler. And thankfully for some reason, Spearow just keeps going for Pursuit, and now Noctowl can Growl, and between the Growl, the Curse, and the Sleep, we were finally able to defeat Spiro. Again, I want to point out that I have a level 34 Noctowl and a mid-20s Graveler before Gym 1. Yes, I did battle a bunch of trainers, and yes, they have level 100 Pokemon. But I just want you to understand, this took forever. 
2745. Anyway, the next trainer has two Pidgey, and it seems like these Pidgey have the same programming where they will always attack. And that's a bit of a problem for me, unless you have a level 34 Noctowl, and you can see my reaction there to Wing Attack not KOing. So there is a strategy, but I'll need to do this again. In the end, it didn't prove that simple. It took another five hours to beat Bird Keeper Rod. I can tank the first attack and in theory put Pidgey to sleep. That's not the issue. It could perhaps take a couple attempts for me to actually achieve this, but in the end, that's the thing I can do. What I can't do is survive long enough to knock out both Pidgeys, and again, these ones always attack, making them far more difficult than Youngster Mikey's Pidgey because they only have attacking moves. So in the end, the strategy was to just use a bunch of sand attacks, then swap in Noctowl, try to put it to sleep again, and then growl it a bunch. I want to point out, by the way, that while we are speeding things up to make a lot of things less tedious, this has been five hours of real time. But the strategy actually is do as much damage with Noctowl as possible, set up all your defense curls with Graveler, and then use Graveler to knock out Pidgey. Thankfully, after all those defense curls, we will tank this wing attack, and we can start going for Rock Throw, and eventually, once we're close to being knocked out, we can use Self-Destruct, and that is how you make it to the first gym leader. This took forever, and it's not as if Falconer is going to be any easier, right? Falconer leads with his Pidgey, and I don't know if this one... Oh! Interesting! In Gen 1, the code made all Gym Leader Pokémon have their last four moves, which typically were better than the terrible moves they start off with. But because all the Gym Leaders in Gen 2 have custom movesets, I don't believe they have different movesets than we're used to, which, while at level 100 are still pretty devastating, are way less devastating than stuff like Wing Attack. Yeah, I mean, Gust from level 100 Pidgeotto isn't great, and it can still knock out Noctowl at half health, but it's a much weaker move than Wing Attack. So in a way, Falconer might end up being easier than the two trainers in his gym, but that's not to say he's going to be easy. Bayleaf resists Mud Slap, but until it can tank a tackle, we can't lead with it. And so, because I've defeated all the other trainers, we're going to have to level it up by defeating some pretty weak Pokemon, and that means I have to spend tons of times in the Runes of Alf and knocking out a bunch of Unknown, which is bad. 35 hours, 29 minutes. That's how long it's taken to get to this attempt. And finally, at level 28, we tank the tackle and use Poison Powder. Now we can do a strat you may have seen before. We swap in Haunter, and then either Butterfree or Noctowl, it really doesn't matter, because Pidgey is always going to try to use the move that's effective. Against Haunter, that's Mud Slap. Against Noctowl, that's Tackle. And because Pidgey is poisoned, it is going to slowly, but surely, faint. Against Pidgeotto, I send in Bayleaf because I don't want my Haunter to faint. Then I send in Noctowl. Gust, unfortunately, crits. And... I'm devastated because that was the whole strategy. So we have to do that whole annoying thing all over again, but I'll fast forward to when we get to Pidgeotto. Okay, so if Gust doesn't crit, we can put it to sleep with Hypnosis, and now you can tell what we're gonna do, because it's the quickest way to knock something out in this game, using Curse. Now, Pidgeotto only has four turns left, in theory. In practice, there's a bit of a problem here, because if you knock something out, Curse actually won't activate. However, we can kind of manipulate Pidgeotto the same way we manipulated Pidgey. We can't avoid all attacks because it uses Gust, but we can let other Pokémon faint, swap in Graveler, and then swap to a Flying Pokémon so it goes for Mud Slap. And because we have the perfect amount of Flying Pokémon, it actually works out perfectly. I just have to send out Graveler one last time, and then swap to Noctowl, it has to go for Mud Slap, and finally, after 5 hours and 15 minutes of real time, over 7 times that in in-game time, we have gotten past what is supposedly one of the easiest first gym leaders in Pokemon history. 
I would beg to differ, at least in a level 100 challenge. Now, there aren't a ton of new Pokemon that open up prior to Bugsy, but bug types are pretty weak. And remember, two of his Pokemon are a Kakuna and a Metapod, neither of whom have good attacks to begin with. So it really is just Scyther, and that might make Bugsy a whole lot easier. Not that anything in this challenge is going to be easy. Heck, there were a bunch of just regular trainers that took me a long time to defeat, but we've already spent just 10 minutes on beating the first gym, and we have an entire rest of the game to get through, so we're gonna have to skip ahead a little bit. So like I said, Bugsy leads with Metapod, and because Metapod can't do anything, I can go for one of my favorite strategies in Gen 2, Defense Curl Rollout. Now unfortunately, there's no way to get Golem, but you can get Graveler all the way to level 36. Graveler was really useful in the previous level 100 challenge, and it absolutely obliterates Scyther, leading to an easy first try victory. But if you're a little disappointed by that, don't worry, we still have to battle Rival 2. Now, Rival 2's Pokemon didn't have custom movesets program, so like every other trainer, it's just the last four move they learn via level up. That means Ghastly can't damage a normal Pokemon like Pidgeotto, although it would take it like 10 years to knock it out, so I had to think of a better strategy. I decided to lead with Haunter, even though Nightshade would be a one-hit KO, but Ghastly withdraws and goes into Quilava, which is interesting because it should have Nightshade. Quilava goes for Flamethrower and that will one-shot Graveler, which is a pretty big problem. In the end, not even the mighty Noctowl can withstand Flamethrower, and that's a problem since Noctowl is pretty high special defense. It's also at an absurdly high level, it almost has to go into retirement, so I needed a new strategy, and probably a new Pokemon. 50 hours, 54 minutes. We haven't made it out of Azalea, but we have a new Pokemon. Also, we have a new strategy. We lead with Noctowl because Noctowl can put Ghastly to sleep. Then we go into Haunter so it gets knocked out quickly. Then we use Pidgeotto because Pidgeotto can't get damaged. It's also not a very useful Pokemon. So when Zubat comes out, we can just let it faint. Now the strategy is to use Graveler and to use Rollout we can't really set up Defense Curl reliably, although I kind of wish I did, because it would have worked well there. And I go into Noctowl, once again, I try to put Zubat to sleep, and then I can use Curse once again. We have an odd number of HP, so we actually have one more Curse remaining, and Zubat actually does get knocked out, with Tentacruel in the lead, the new Pokemon I have to hopefully be able to tank a Flamethrower and it uses Swift, which of course does one-shot Tentacruel. But you wanna hear something funny, something hilarious? Noctowl can survive, look at that face. Noctowl can survive, but it's clearly a range. But what that tells me is if I level up Noctowl a little bit more, we can make the range more favorable and we have a strategy. In the end, after like 50 battles, I finally get another one that works out we have Bitterberry equipped, and this time around, I actually don't go for Curse. I use Noctowl itself to knock out Ghastly. Once it gets confused, I think about swapping, and then I do something interesting. I wanted to go right back to sleep. I actually get really lucky with sleep turns, and I do put it back to sleep. Now I can swap in Graveler, and you can tell what's gonna happen here. Defense Curl, then roll out, and hopefully Ghastly stays asleep, which it does. Zubat goes for mean look, but I want to stay in. Unfortunately, Graveler can't tank this flamethrower. If it could, the battle would be over right here. Instead, we have to go into Noctowl now at level 43, which almost always survives the flamethrower. And now we're going to use Pidgeotto for sand attack. You've already seen this strategy employed before. And without sand attack, this wouldn't be possible because we have to put Quilava to sleep and use Curse. Now, if Curse worked the way it does now, where it would activate after the new Pokemon swapped in, then it would be fine. But because Curse doesn't work that way, we need to lower accuracy. Quilava still has Swift, but if we swap in Haunter, it has to go for Flamethrower, and finally, 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 we're gonna make it into Goldenrod City, where a lot more Pokemon open up, 
but we still have to deal with rollout mill tank which at level 100 could be bad but we do have graveler so maybe it's actually not so bad remember clefairy's gonna have its same terrible move set and we're starting to enter a point where we have fully evolved pokemon albeit very low level and they're using pre-evolved pokemon so things may get a little easier but i'm not sure all right so whitney leads with clefairy i know it has double slap so i lead with haunter and what i'm gonna do with haunter is go for hypnosis it misses metronome low kick and i could just go for curse which i am gonna do and then i could swap into the graveler i go for confuse ray first then i go for pidgeotto i want to make darn sure that my graveler can set up as much as it wants oh missed i forgot about that well anyway now it gets knocked out miltank comes out and goes for rollout this is i'm not sure well yeah that's bad so rollout actually luckily misses but miltank also has stomp i decide to go for rollout and after a couple three stomp misses four stomp misses wow we get miltank to really low health and unlike in newer games low health doesn't mean automatic heal they can't heal unfortunately miltank now is hitting every stomp but we still have haunter which means it has to go for rollout which means it misses i have to go for curse because nightshade won't work it goes for rollout but noctowl is bulky enough that against whitney considered to be the hardest gym leader or at least early gym leader in pokemon history we actually get a first try victory so in the end that's actually two gym leaders with first try victories and in fact the harder trainers have indeed been the trainers since they have their last four moves move sets which aren't even supposed to be good it's kind of funny how that works the next gym leader is morty who uses ghost type pokemon and if you've ever watched Nuzlocks or anything of Gen 2, you'll know Morty has a really, really hard time with normal type Pokemon, such as Pidgeotto. Now, other than a couple additions, you may have noticed that most of my Pokemon are the same ones that we've used from the very beginning. Kind of interesting how that's worked that way. But since they're all getting really high up there in level, you also might be noticing that sooner or later, they're going to have to be exchanged, which is going to suck because this Pidgeotto, while typically just used for sand attack, it's actually doing a pretty good job. And yes, I could swap into Noctowl, but like we were just talking about, if we use Noctowl, although it may be quicker, we would have to get rid of Noctowl quicker. So that's a part of the strategy here. We want to make sure our Pokemon don't overlevel. We also could have probably gotten Pidgeot, and unfortunately, because I forgot to equip Mintberry, I can no longer use Pidgeotto because what Gengar is going to do is use Dream Eater. But in theory and in practice, I can do the exact same thing I did versus Falconer, swap back and forth. And as long as I can keep count, then I can swap until it no longer has any Dream Eaters remaining. And then I can just safely keep Pidgeotto in which is exactly what i do and not only does it run out of dream eater it actually also runs out of shadow ball and that means i can use supersonic on tentacruel and bubble beam and pretty much whatever i want in order to knock out gengar and it takes a very very long time and eventually what happens is gengar runs out of all its moves and starts going for struggle which is not something I envisioned happening. Struggle is actually its best move so far, but Graveler, thankfully, is quite defensively bulky and takes it out. And now all that's left is the final Haunter. It goes for Nightshade and knocks it out, but our Pidgeotto while asleep, and now it can't switch, which is pretty bad. But this one doesn't have Curse, however, it does have Wing Attack. And that is a bit of an issue because although it's a pretty weak move it's still a damaging move but now we have noctowl in i'm gonna try to keep it asleep i've got to go for growl so i have one extra turn and i'm trying to confuse it so it knocks itself out in confusion maybe we'll knock it out unfortunately noctowl gets knocked out itself and nightshade's enough to knock me out so morty sadly will not be a first try victory 
That stinks because this is a pretty long battle. And so I'm not going to narrate the next one. I'm just going to show you that it did take a couple more attempts, but I do get a win. The biggest difference in this battle, honestly, uh, we have to fast forward a bit for it, is against the Gengar. Rather than just use Bubble Beam, this time we use Supersonic and Gengar actually hits itself in confusion. And that does way more damage than we can do to Gengar itself. Now what we can do against the Haunter, and this is important, is rather than going for Wing Attack, which would be very bad to go for, I instead go for Sand Attack, which doesn't get mimicked. Instead, it mimics Whirlwind, which is probably the best move it could mimic. It does work, and I accidentally use Self Destruct there, but it doesn't really matter. We're gonna confuse it. It can't do anything to any of my other Pokemon. In fact, the quicker it knocks them out, the less annoying Whirlwind will be. So that's pretty good. And now I can just swap in Pidgeotto, keep going for Wing Attack, swap in Noctowl, Confusion does even more. Haunter comes in and I even get off Curse because of that Sand Attack. That's gonna speed things up a little bit. And although it wasn't a first try victory, with some good strategy, we were finally able to make it by Morty. That's four gym leaders down, but four more to go. The next gym leader is typically Chuck. His movesets are always kind of bad, relying on some pretty bad moves for Primate, and then Surf's pretty good on Polyrath, but Dynamic Punch can miss a lot. Now, like Morty, Chuck also has a really hard time with a certain type of Pokemon, or at least Primate does. And that's, of course, Ghost Pokemon. There's nothing Primeape can do. And so we can curse, we can put it to sleep. And if we want to, we can even go and send in Tentacruel, which will be good setup for Polyrath. Now, unfortunately, I get hit with Dynamic Punch, which really, really sucks. Noctowl comes in because it can tank Surf. It can also try to put it to sleep, but I miss with Hypnosis, and it doesn't miss with the second Dynamic Punch. Surf will one-shot Graveler. We don't have Quick Claw on it. Pidgeot, Pidgeotto Evolved. It avoids Dynamic Punch, but it cannot tank Surf. So this may be a bit of a problem. However, we got a little bit unlucky with Dynamic Punches early, so we're gonna knock out Primeape again. This time Haunter stays out, so I swap in this Onix, which honestly is just there for fodder. Now we can swap in Noctowl. Hopefully miss Dynamic Punch, put it to sleep. This time, everything works out. And I could go into Haunter and use Curse. I think that's what I'm gonna do. It stays asleep. It stays asleep. We have Curse. And now we're gonna go for Confuse Ray, which is really good. We can even start using Nightshade. And now it's at below half HP, so it only has two turns remaining. We can swap in Tentacruel, hoping it goes for Surf. And after it hits itself in Confusion, it has only a sliver of HP remaining. Now, typically, the AI will pick a move that does more damage, which would mean Dynamic Punch, which means we can swap into Haunter, which means we avoid Dynamic Punch, which means we win. This took about three tries, and so we're really starting to hit our groove. But remember, like we've been talking about, we are about to hit a wall. Because while up to now we've been able to avoid most optional trainers, there are a ton of mandatory trainers with level 100 Pokemon coming up very, very soon. And that means I have to start thinking about new Pokemon that are gonna replace these guys, which is part of the reason I had that Onix, because I don't wanna overuse my Pokemon and have to stop using them earlier than might be necessary. Especially with something like Haunter, which there are no ghosts, at least not until the very end of the game. Now's a good time to mention that in this challenge, I do play with Species Claws, I will not use a Pokemon more than once because I feel like part of the challenge is knowing when to use these Pokemon at which time. And part of the fun is having to use a bunch of different Pokemon you otherwise would never really use. All right, well, in the meantime, Jasmine, we still have our A team out there and Magnemite does have Sonic Boom, which on a level 100 Pokemon is pretty bad. Unfortunately, we don't have Magnitude on Graveler. Competitive battle YouTuber FreezeEye talks a lot about this. I think he calls it four moves syndrome. But essentially, we only have four move slots. So even though Magnitude in this battle would be really helpful, in general, it was better to have a move like Mud Slap that lowers accuracy and does a little bit of damage, which is why I kept it. And you can see here why that's so useful. We can swap in Tentacruel now, 
since Tentacruel isn't as useful, there's so many water Pokemon, and Magnemite never hits. Now we can swap back in Graveler, and we can start going for Mudslap again. Again, I don't want to get rid of Graveler so quickly, because there aren't a ton of Rock Ground Pokemon. There is Rhyhorn, but it's not coming until very late in the game. Luckily, five Mudslaps were the exact amount I needed to knock out Magnemite, and then Steelix comes out and knocks out Graveler. Now out comes Haunter, it does outspeed Steelix, but doesn't put it to sleep. Noctowl will get an opportunity, Noctowl does put it to sleep. I start using Growl, that proves to be very useful as now Iron Tail doesn't knock me out. And as I put Steelix to sleep again, I can continue using Growls, which will hopefully mean that any of my Pokemon should be able to survive Steelix's attacks. I go for Supersonic, it goes for Sunny Day, that was a bit of a mistake. That does nothing as I believe it has minimum attack. And while the Growls are coming in handy, Surf, even once the sun is gone, does next to nothing. Thankfully, however, in Generation 2, there aren't as many potions, and thus Steelix is unable to heal. I've been doing a ton of crazy Generation 3 challenges you're going to see pretty soon, and trust me, in those games, they heal all the time. Sometimes it's nice when low HP really means low HP, and Jasmine ended up being not bad at all, surprisingly. Now all we have left are Price and Claire, but we also have the entire Team Rocket section, which, if we're not careful, could cost us a couple of our Pokemon, or at the very least, we're going to have to train up specific Pokemon just to defeat Team Rocket, which I might do. Well, after I beat half the Team Rocket side quest, I can battle Price. Tentacruel is a pretty good option because of its high special defense and the fact it resists a lot of Price's moves, However, the seal does have headbutt, and since Tentacruel has not great defense, it's not the best option. So, what we can do is try to confuse seal, and headbutt's not a 1 KO. That is one option. The other option is to try to go for Haunter and just get a curse off right away, but Aurora Beam one shots, which is annoying. So Price is going to give us a lot more difficulty than the previous gym leaders have. And I decide to change my strategy, catch a Magnemite, and evolve it into Magneton. Now, it can tank every one of Seal's moves because it resists all of them, although it's only level 35, which is unfortunate, and it only has Thunder Shock. But we've paralyzed it and confused it. Now we can go for Haunter and use Curse, and hopefully Seal hits itself in Confusion. It doesn't but we can use Fortress with Protect, since Curse is active, and then use Headbutt, try to flinch. Fortress doesn't have great special defense. I knew Price was gonna heal there, so I just went for Headbutt, then I go for Protect. This is gonna take a couple more turns. We get a pretty clutch flinch, but unfortunately, Seal is now going to heal, so I have to, I don't even know what I have to do. I could go for Self-Destruct, and yeah, it's just gonna go back for rest. I'm not really sure what to do here. Unless we get the clutchest flinch you've ever seen, it's just gonna keep resting and resting and yeah. So this strat doesn't work. Well, I level up my Pokemon a little bit more, namely Fortress, and I go for a very similar strategy. We get Haunter, we use Curse, and then we use Fortress. But this time I've taught Fortress Rollout, and Rollout does enough damage to knock out Seal. Unfortunately, Dugong immediately uses Aurora Beam, which even though I resist, knocks me out. And that is going to be GG. Hypno, good special defense, not good enough. Noctowl, good special defense, it's super effective against it. Okay, Price is proving to be a real obstacle here. We have now spent an hour between battling Price and trying to change strategies and get new Pokemon. The new strategy is to use Hypno to put the seal to sleep, because if it's asleep, it can't use rest, and thus it won't be able to heal. At least, it won't be able to heal from rest. Price still has the Hyper Potion, and unfortunately, then rest does activate, but thanks to how powerful Rollout is, combined with Curse, we do knock out Seal. Now we have the same problem essentially with Dugong, and I decided to bring in a new Pokemon. Lantern. Lantern, like Magneton before it, resists a lot of attacks and is Thunder Wave, which will allow Haunter to outspeed. If only Haunter had one more HP, it would be really nice. But I'm going to just spoil this for you as AJ speeds up the footage. We ran into the exact same problem with Dugong, 
that we ran into with Seal, and we still haven't made it to Piloswine. So this is looking like a real, real problem. Finally, after another eight minutes, I actually knock out Dugong thanks to self-destruct, but once Piloswine came out, all I had left was Hypno, which had no chance. And even though we've made it to Piloswine, it doesn't seem like we're that much closer to actually beating Price. And I, I simply don't know what to do at this point. How can I beat Price? What could I possibly use? How about a Pokemon that is double weak to Price's attacks? Skiploom. Skiploom is one of the best Pokemon for these niche challenges because of Leech Seed. Level 100, zero experience, pacifist, all of those significantly limit the amount of damage you can deal to opponents. But Leech Seed, because in this case, the opponents have such high levels, we actually can just keep out Hypno and gain back all our HP and waste Price's Hyper Potion. Although this method is kind of slower, it allows us to keep our useful Pokemon like Hypno at full HP, allowing them to survive later into the battle, and that will prove super useful because remember, in the last battle you saw, what happened was we just simply ran into Pokemon, which shouldn't happen this time. So we have to switch a lot to avoid Seal's attacks. But in the end, we have our Tentacruel indirectly knock it out. Now I go for Supersonic against Dugong because I don't want my useful Hypno or Skip Plume to faint. I decide to just go for Rollout because it is super effective and deal as much damage as possible. It didn't deal enough damage and now I have a choice. Hypno should be able to tank one attack and it just barely tanks Aurora Beam, which is why we needed to get it to level 36. Now, thankfully, Dugong stays asleep, and while Leech Seed misses the first turn, it doesn't miss the second turn, and this is where Tentacruel or Lantern comes in. I decide to be greedy and go for Tentacruel, and I get super good luck with Dugong staying asleep. I actually swap it out and get even better luck in that Hypno is now getting its HP restored. Dugong hits itself in confusion, and now we have pretty much everything useful remaining for Piloswine. Hypno outspeeds due to Quick Claw. That's right, I'm using Quick Claw finally. Now that Piloswine is asleep, I can use Curse, I can use Confuse Ray, and I can even use Nightshade if I want to. Piloswine wakes up and goes for Blizzard. I go into Skip Bloom to try and put it back to sleep, and Fury Attack really, really clutchly, if that's a word, misses. And that's going to be the battle. All we need for Skiploom to do is hit with Leech Seed and Piloswine will faint. And after about two hours of battling Price, a gym leader who's typically very easy, we have that victory. You can see for this battle, we had to use a ton of new team members, ones that probably are going to be pretty useful going forward. Although Jump Bluff, instead of using Hypnosis, it's also very fast, has Sleep Powder, which is part of why it's just so useful. The combination of Sleep and Leech Seed can be quite, quite powerful. But will it be powerful enough to defeat Claire, whose Pokemon actually have very good move sets? Kingdra is always very good, and of course, they're all going to be at level 100. Well, as I save 78 hours in game time, it has taken me to get to this point. Finally, we're ready to battle Claire. I lead with Lantern, paralyze the Dragonair, confuse it, otherwise known as Parafusion, and now I think of who to swap in next, because it's a bit of a tough call. I decide to keep Lantern in and just go for Surf, until it snaps out of Confusion, then I go for Magneton, I use Thunder, and yeah. We don't really have a great way of damaging Dragonair. Let's start again, actually. Okay. So, Confuse Ray is good, Thunder Wave is good, getting hit in Confusion is very good for Dragonair. Now, I think I gotta go to Haunter or Graveler, because Graveler, I can use Earthquake, which does decent damage, but this Dragonair has Surf. I mean, when I say decent damage, consider I'm like a third of its level, but <sighs> that didn't work. Okay, let's try that again. Eventually, we're gonna get hit by Slam, and... We got crit by Slam, and that is the face of someone who did not expect Slam to do that much damage. 
So yeah, slam misses. That's really good. We've gotten really lucky, really lucky with this so far. And now I think we got to go into Haunter. It goes for slam. I can use curse, but here's the thing. If I use curse now, that means Haunter is out for the rest of the battle. And now we can use protect and we can then swap in lantern to try and tank surf. But since Haunter is fainted, once it goes for slam, oh, it heals. Well, I won't have something to swap in. And yeah, this, this is not a good strategy. We might have to use Skip Plume. I wanted to avoid using it because it's going to be super useful later. But I think you know what we're going to do. We're going to paralyze it. We're going to confuse it. And then we're going to hope Jump Bluff, not Skip Plume, is able to use Leech Seed. Thankfully, even though I'm hit by Thunder Wave, I am able to use Leech Seed so I can swap in Fortress. Now I can swap in Lantern and kind of go back and forth because it's just going to alternate between Slam, which does very little to Fortress, and Surf, which does very little to Lantern. It's not quite as good as Falconer Strats where we get rid of Mud Slap, but it's good enough. And thanks to Leech Seed, we gain back pretty much all our HP. Plus, we do have Protect. So we knock out Dragonair number one, and I'm pretty sure this is going to be the Flamethrower Dragonair. Now, this can either be Ice Beam Dragonair or Thunderbolt Dragonair. I swap in Hypno, and good thing I did, it was Thunderbolt Dragonair. And Thunderbolt Dragonair would completely just destroy my entire team. So what do we do here? This is looking kind of like Price, where we're not getting very far into the battle, and I don't have a lot of ideas. Well, I do have a couple ideas. I always have some ideas. So we're going to now catch Lapras. I have the Paralysis Cure Berry. And Lapras is interesting because it has Sing, it has Ice Beam, and if we want to be really cheeky, it has Perish Song. But I decide to just use Ice Beam. Now, I know Dragonair is going to heal, so I go for Perish Song. The problem is Claire is going to switch out, and she also uses Full Heal. I switch into Tentacruel, but it's already confused, and that's not a great strategy. I don't know what to do here. I swap into Hypno, and yeah, she's just going to swap out. I can put it to sleep, and I can use Ice Bunch, but that's going to do, like, nothing. Yeah. Alright, well, we have, like, the beginnings of an idea, but right now it needs to be refined a lot. I level up a little bit more, and this time what I do is, well, the same thing as last time, except Thunder Wave misses. I also don't bother confusing Dragonair, I just go for Ice Beam right away, and notice Lapras has been leveled up quite a bit. Now it's going to go for Hyper Potion, but these aren't full restores, and because Dragonair has so much health, it actually doesn't heal. We get a Clutch Freeze, and that means we knock out the Dragonair without taking any damage. Now, I don't know if this is Thunderbolt or Ice Beam. I'm going to assume it's Thunderbolt. So I swap in Hypno. It is, in fact, Thunderbolt, which is a problem. We don't get Quick Law activation, and so we faint. Slam does a ton to Lantern, and we are able to get off Parafusion, which is nice, but that's about it. We can then swap into Fortress and try for Explosion. That does a ton. Doesn't knock it out, but puts it in range for Lapras to outspeed due to Paralysis and knock it out with Ice Beam. Now, this is Ice Beam Lapras, but Slam is the move I need to worry about. And unfortunately, speaking of Ice Beam, I have actually run out of Ice Beams. Lapras is one of the few Pokemon that can learn it via level up, which is why I'm using it. And I've got to swap here into Tentacruel. I have... Poison Sting, which I can use. Oh, I actually get the poison. That's pretty lucky. And yeah, I'm just going to hope I survive. I do. Nice. And we get a crit and knock it out. So that's going to bring out Kingdra for the very first time, which uses Hyper Beam, which is really good. Okay, now I can swap in Haunter and put it to sleep. And then I could go for Curse, but better yet, let's just go for Perish Song. Now we win in three turns. We just need Kingdra not to attack us for three turns. I swap into Haunter. If it went for Hyper Beam there, it wouldn't affect Haunter, but it stays asleep. I swap in Lapras. It stays asleep anyway. And so Lapras with Ice Beam Sing, Confuse Ray, and Perish Song proved an invaluable team member almost single-handedly defeating Claire, although with some very important help from other team members. The first six gym leaders, other than Falconer, 
weren't so bad. The last two have been terrible, and that doesn't bode well for us because our Pokemon are starting to near level 50, and we have the hardest four trainers in the entire game, arguably the hardest five trainers in the entire game, all in a row with decent movesets at level 100. This is going to take a ton, a ton of trial and error. I have no idea whether this will be possible, but can we possibly do it? There's only one way to find out. Guys, we've spent almost a hundred hours. I did a lot of preparation building a team for the Elite Four. We know it's not going to work, but the question is why? So first team member I'll introduce is Umbreon. Umbreon being dark type has a pretty good matchup against Will. Unfortunately for me, it can't do that much because Toxic isn't acquired until Kanto. All we can do is go for Confuse Ray. Remember, we can't get leftovers either. And then we can hit it with a few growls. It can confuse us as well, which is pretty annoying. So yeah, that's pretty much what Umbreon can do. Eventually, we can use it to swap, which is kind of nice, but we're probably going to have to somehow get off a Leech Seed. The most stressful thing, to be honest with you, is that I need to make sure the six Pokemon I take are the best six Pokemon, and you can see me swapping Haunter for Hypno. Is Hypno the best Pokemon for every Elite Four member, or just for Will? That's hard to say. Against Will, it can tank the Psychic, and then I can swap in Jump Bluff and use Leech Seed. We've seen this strategy before, and it's a very effective way at keeping Pokemon around. Now Umbreon can go for Growl, Quick Attack will do next to nothing, and Psychic won't affect it. So in theory, Zatu is now completely useless. The only thing it can really do is we can hit ourselves in Confusion. In fact, if I really want to be cheeky, I can swap in Hypno here and there, and gain all of its HP back because Zatu won't anticipate it and go for Psychic. It's the thing about playing humans versus AI. The AI will always act in a predictable manner and humans will be able to read what you're doing and react to it. It's why being good at single player Pokemon does not mean you'll be good at competitive battling. The problem solving and puzzle solving is totally different. Anyway, after what feels like an eternity, Zatu eventually is going to get knocked out, and I don't know what's going to come out after Zatu. It turns out to be the Jinx. So Jinx has Ice Punch, and that's enough to one-shot Umbreon, which is very, 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 very bad. Lapras would be able to tank an Ice Punch, but Psychic knocks it out. So, yeah. Leech Seed strats are great, but they don't really work when every single Pokemon can just one a KO pretty much all your Pokemon with one of its moves. They only really work when you can set up Leech Seed, but how can you do that if you can never swap Jump Bluff in? So that's really the goal here. Figure out ways of getting Jump Bluff to swap in and then use Leech Seed. But as you can see, that is very much easier said than done. I mean, heck, even knocking out one Pokemon is a pretty major accomplishment. I have now spent almost three hours on the will battle. I have a level 45 Jinx. When this started, I didn't have a Jinx. So I have really tried my hardest to build a team specifically for defeating Will, which isn't even smart because I still have to defeat everyone else. And yet, even with this team purpose built to defeat Will, I'm still just losing over and over and over and over and over again. It's really frustrating. And it's not like I'm even close. So is that it? Is the run over? No, it's not. But we did change up our strategy quite a lot. We had to level up Lapras an insane amount. And in this battle, we actually got a super, super clutch freeze. In theory, I can just reset until I get freezes. But this is super, super important because if we get the freeze, then Will, even when he heals, unlike in later games, these aren't full restores. They are only max potions, meaning Lapras can be restored to full health via Leech Seed. Then Jinx, remember how Psychic knocked it out in one hit? It unfortunately is a range which I don't get, 
My Jinx is also a range, but this one is much more favorable to me. We put Jinx asleep, and now you know what's going to happen. We use Leech Seed, and slowly but surely, Umbreon, which can't do much itself but is super bulky, is able to wait Jinx out. Now, because Slowbro is so slow, we have to get a little lucky and swap it in at the right time. We can swap in Jinx, and remember Haunter? Well, I decided to bring it back. Slowbro proved so darn annoying with Curse and Body Slam that the only way I was able to defeat it consistently was via Curse. And that's exactly what I do. Notice as soon as it wakes up, it goes for Body Slam, but Haunter is out. Even though Executor isn't very fast, it is faster than Haunter. So I do have to swap in Jinx to tank the attack. And then I swap in Umbreon and use Growl because Executor does have physical attacks like Egg Bomb. I have Rest, and since Egg Bomb can miss a lot, that's pretty helpful. But yeah, I didn't really find a better way to knock out Executor, and this took an insanely, insanely long time. Also keep in mind Executor has Leech Seed itself, which is super, super, super annoying. But in the end, Umbreon was actually able to wait it out, leading to the final Zatu to come out. Ideally, Lapras would be around to use Perish Song, but that doesn't happen. So what I try to do is confuse Zatu. Don't forget, I still have Leech Seed. And now I kind of have to get a little lucky here. I swap in Haunter. I hope it hits something Confusion so I can use Curse. Doesn't work. Now I go for Explosion, hoping that will knock out Zatu. Doesn't work. Now I send an Umbreon. I doubt Bite would do enough, so I go for Rest. And now it's going to go for Quick Attack. I have a few turns to sleep. And I don't know how much Bite will do. Oh, Bite would have knocked it out. Okay, good to know. And that is one Elite Four member defeated. This team was purpose built for Will. So it may not actually work against the rest of the Elite Four. And it still took me about four hours to get just one victory. Where remember, we got a freeze turn one. That's a bad sign. All right, well, Koga, I'm just going to spoil it, absolutely destroyed my team. I was able to knock out Ariados pretty well, so that felt pretty good. But then Muck came out, and there was really very little I could do. It did way too much damage with Sludge Bomb, could up its accuracy, and so I simply took the experience points and opted to rethink my strategy and try again, because we need something that will damage Muck. And I know a Pokemon that's pretty good, at least against Sludge Bomb, if we could find a way to make it work. Well, two hours later, an hour and a half of which was to beat Will a second time, are we going to make any progress versus Koga? Remember, Ariados likes to use Baton Pass, so it's important to use Cotton Spore. Just so if it does Baton Pass out, not only will it be Leech Seeded, but it'll also be very slow, so we could do whatever we want to the next Pokemon. It doesn't Baton Pass, so we're good. So now Fortress in theory would be really good against Muck, and we use Sandstorm. In Generation 1, Sandstorm actually deals 1 8th as opposed to 1 16th. So it will take 8 turns to knock out Muck. Muck also has nothing it can do versus Fortress. It's simply a matter of me losing patience as it goes for Acid Armor. And wow, I get really lucky with a crit. I get really lucky with two crits. Let's go. All right, we got past Muck. Next comes out Venomoth and it confuses me. Had I hit with rollout there, it would have been exceptional, but that's okay. That's okay. We still have a really good matchup versus Venomoth, but at the same time, I'm going to swap an Umbreon here because I thought it might go for Psychic. Now it goes for Gust. So I could, yeah, I do tank the Psychic. I shouldn't have gone for rollout there. What I should have done is either gone for Sandstorm or Explosion. That's okay. Now we don't have a good swap in for Gust. Although it's a weak move at level 100. Everything is a strong move. I can send in Jinx. I wonder if I'll be able... Okay, I can put it to sleep. Now we can kind of pick what we do here. I think Jump Bluff's the best strat. Always if you can use Leech Seed, you should use Leech Seed. And we do. And that means we can send in Umbreon, which is immune to Psychic and has really good defense. 
We also have Detect. Unfortunately, Protect, which is better, is not available until, you guessed it, Kanto. All the best things are. Anyway, we do a bit of swapping to make sure Venomoth can't really do anything to me. Then comes out Koga's Fortress. So I outspeed this thing, put it to sleep, and use Curse, meaning in four turns, Fortress will get knocked out. We really don't want to see spikes because we switch out our Pokemon a lot. That would be really, really bad. Anyway, with Leech Seed and Curse, we knock it out, and now Koga's at his last Pokemon. He can Wing Attack and knock out our Haunter. And now I want to see if Jinx will survive Wing Attack. It doesn't. That's okay. I hope Lapras does. Oh, I get Sing. I get Paris Song. I get a win here. Let's go. In fact, I can swap in Umbreon here and I can swap in Lapras. Let's go. All right, Koga really wasn't so bad. We just had to refine our strategy a little bit against Muck to make it a little more doable. I mean, the double crit rollout really helped. Unfortunately, I ran into a problem here where I ran out of money, and that means I won't be able to beat the Elite Four on this attempt, but at least I'll learn the strategies, and I'm not that close to level 50, so gaining levels will make subsequent attempts easier by making ranges a lot less favorable. In the meantime, we can go and battle Bruno, who's way better than Red and Bluno, but he's still not what I would consider to be good. All right, against Bruno, I know Hitmontop likes to go for Dig, and I wanted to see how much that would do to Lapras, which isn't very much. Of course, I could always swap in Jump Bluff here or something else. It doesn't really matter. I'm just kind of trying to figure out a strategy here. So we can put him on top to sleep, and then we can use Cotton Spore. Unfortunately, that's not going to slow down Quick Attack enough, and it did so much damage that it would two-shot Jump Bluff. So this is probably going to be a failed attempt. What I can do is swap in and out to waste all its dig power points. It's going to take a while, but we can do that. And then we can put it to sleep with Haunter since it can't damage it anymore. Go for Leech Seed and then restore my HP for Jump Bluff. And oh yeah, it knows Pursuit. <laughs> okay, uh, yeah, that, that changes things. That's, that's, that's bad. Okay, we can still knock out the Hitmon top. That's not a big problem. But then Hitmon Chan comes in, and it proved to be really, really, really good against my team. Even though I said I would, I actually haven't been saving between Elite Four members. So when I reset, I have to go all the way back to Will, which is just fantastic. But you know what? Honestly, we actually are making some progress through the Elite Four. Now, I don't know when the right time to mention this was, but. For whatever reason, because, you know, back in 2020 or whatever, I guess I was just crazy. I decided not to save between Elite Four members. And that made things really, really tedious. But the one positive of doing that is if you don't save between Elite Four members, if you get a victory, it is a super well-earned consistent one, typically. With that said, it has taken me many hours and a lot of team preparation to get back to Bruno. Will and Koga really aren't that easy at this point. And we try for swap strats once again. We try to put Hitmon top to sleep. The most important thing to do is to get Leech Seed. And eventually, I will get the Leech Seed. Then start using Cotton Spore and hope that it doesn't go for Pursuit. Because that would be really bad and it takes a lot less time to knock out Hitmon top, and Haunter is now out versus Onix. That means Onix is going to go for Earthquake, so I can swap in Jump Bluff. Now it's going to go for Rock Slide. I don't have the best swap in for that. I can swap into Fortress. It still does a ton, and there's really not much Fortress can do versus Onix other than just Protect. Since it went for Earthquake, I can go for Explosion since it would be a 3 KO, and at least that gets me a swap in that I like. That swap in is Umbreon, and I'm trying my best to confuse and knock it out, but the Onyx also has Sandstorm, which you can see does a ton of damage to me. And yeah, that didn't really do much. But, but, Onyx goes for Bind inexplicably against Lapras, and Ice Beam does knock it out. Now out comes Hitmonlee. I can swap into Haunter here, because I don't believe Hitmonlee actually has a move that can damage Haunter, which is pretty good. We can put it to sleep, get Leech Seed, get Curse, and then eventually, bye-bye Hitmonlee. 
Unfortunately, last battle and this battle, it's Hitmonchan that proves to be the man for Bruno because we don't get the luck with Sing and Hitmonchan has such good moves, not normally, but at level 100, that it just ends my attempt right in its track. There was one more Pokemon left. We still hadn't fought Machamp, which is pretty good, but yeah, Hitmonchan's gonna be a problem. Now, 27 hours into the challenge, I decided, you know what, we're not gonna beat this without saving in between. Let's just see if we can beat this with saving in between. You've already pretty much seen the strategy with Hitmon Top. Nothing really new is about to happen here. Just a lot of swapping, trying to get cursed, trying to knock out Hitmon Top as quick as possible. Takes a long time. Okay, if Jump Bluff is out, the next Pokemon coming out is Hitmon Chan. Now, this is where you get luck based strats. I have Quick Law and I get the Sleep Powder. That is huge because with Sleep Powder, we can potentially equip Leech Seed. Unfortunately, Hitmonchan immediately wakes up, but now what we can do is do some swapping. Haunter can't be affected by Mock Punch, so by switching Haunter in, it's gonna go for one of the Elemental Punches, which doesn't do enough to Umbreon to make up for the amount, of, well, actually it just does enough to make up for the amount of damage that Leech Seed takes away. So by swapping back and forth, we can finally defeat Hitmonchan. Hitmon Lee uses Swagger, but I have a Bitterberry equipped because I know it's gonna do that since I've battled Bruno now about 50 times. Now all I need to do is use Curse, swap back and forth to avoid confusion, and then knock out Hitmon Lee. Since Jump Bluff is fainted, I have to sacrifice Jinx, which doesn't do that much anyway. Now Onyx is gonna set up Sandstorm, which is really lucky, so I can use Surf. Now it's going to go for Cross Chop. I swap in Haunter. Sandstorm does a little bit more damage. Now I can swap in Fortress. It's gonna go for Rock Slide. Sandstorm still rages. It doesn't miss with Cross Chop, which is what I was hoping would happen. Cross Chop only has five power points, so I can use Detect and that gets rid of one more cross drop. I can swap in Haunter, it uses cross drop again, and now I believe it only has one more. Unfortunately, Rock Slide is its other move and everything is affected by that. I decide to swap in Umbreon, hope for the miss, and it actually goes for Rock Slide, which is pretty good, because that means I can go for Detect and Detect the final cross drop. I actually get off Confuse Ray because Machop has Vital Throw. I forgot it has Vital Throw, that move always goes last. Now I go for Sing because it went for Vital Throw. I guess Rock Slide wouldn't have knocked it out. And that means it gets put to sleep. That means I can use Parish Song. And now if I swap back and forth between Lapras and Haunter, if it wakes up, which it doesn't, it would have used Vital Throw against Haunter, which does nothing, or Rock Slide, which shouldn't want to KO Lapras. Doesn't matter. In 27 hours, almost 28 hours, we have made it past Bruno to the final Elite Four member, Karen. Karen's really annoying. And considering we have a team built for Will, Karen does a lot of damage to my Haunter, to my Jinx. This could be really, really bad. Houndoom is terrible for Fortress. We may need a completely different team here, but might as well see what's gonna happen. All right, Karen leads with her own Umbreon. It's really trolly and it misses with Sand Attack. That's a one in four chance. We put it to sleep. Leech Seed is great. Now I can use Cotton Spore, that's excellent. Slow it down a little bit. Now we can decide who we wanna go into and I decide, you know what? My Umbreon is probably the best thing to use. But then I think about it some more and I'm like, eh, maybe we could try get Curse. Eh, you know what? We'll go to Jump Bluff. It gets hit with Sand Attack and now we can just swap back and forth so that Umbreon doesn't lower stats too much. It uses Faint Attack and that does way more against Jump Bluff than I was expecting. So I'm gonna have to keep Umbreon against Umbreon. I hit it with Confuse Ray. Now it uses Max Potion, so this is gonna take a little while. Because it's confused, I try to swap in Jump Bluff, but it knocks me out, so I restart. And now's the time where I might be spending a really long time figuring out strategy and then inevitably giving up. An hour into this video, and we haven't even made it to the champion. Well, this is attempt number three. The first two attempts haven't gone too well. I'm gonna lead with Jump Luff. Once again, we get the sand attack miss and we put it to sleep, but this time Leech Seed misses. 
So instead I go for Cotton Spore, slow it down, and then swap into Umbreon. Now it confuses me, but that's okay. I actually can swap into Fortress here because Faint Attack is a special attack, but it doesn't do that much to Fortress. And we're going to swap back and forth between Fortress and Umbreon. And hopefully that will work. So far, so good. And in the end, Umbreon, my Umbreon, is victorious. Next comes out Vileplume. Vileplume we can't use Leech Seed against meaning we either have to knock it out with Ice Beam or we're gonna have to use Curse. I swap in Fortress and I think about something. It's gonna use Petal Dance. Petal Dance is double resisted and I decide after getting hit by the second one, Explosion makes the most sense. We get a critical hit and that's really good, but it's not enough to knock out Vileplume. Then I use Detect and I think that's gonna make Vileplume hit itself in confusion. It does. I go for Bite and it doesn't quite knock itself out, but then Vileplume hits itself in confusion again. Two down, three remaining. Murkrow isn't a very good Pokemon. I decide to confuse it, then swap into Lapras, and it crits and one-shots Lapras. It's still confused, so I swap in Jinx, and would you look at that? It hits itself in confusion, and would you look at that? Ice Punch does a ton, but Murkrow, unfortunately, doesn't hit itself in confusion again, goes for a couple faint attacks. I do confuse it. It then does hit itself in confusion and Bite does enough to knock it out, three down. But now comes out the most dangerous Pokemon, Houndoom, went for pursuit so it wouldn't have mattered and nothing I have can stand up to this thing. I still have Quick Claw on Jump Bluff, but it doesn't activate. It knows Crunch, it knows Flamethrower, it destroys me. I've saved here so I can try again and again but I'm not really sure what I'm gonna do. After almost three hours of battling, finally I come up with this strategy. The beginning is pretty recognizable. We use Jump Bluff, and then we use Leech Seed, Sleep Powder, and Cotton Spore. Not in that order, but you get it. Now I go for Mega Drain, as I'm going to just keep Jump Bluff in for now. Karen can use her Max Potion at various times, and she'll always use it if Umbreon gets weak enough. And since Jump Bluff should be able to tank one attack, it can put it right back to sleep and set up for the next Pokemon, Lapras. Lapras tanks things very well, but it gets confused, and so I swap into Umbreon. Also, don't forget, we can't have our Pokemon go over level 50, so spreading out experience points typically is good. Anyway, Viral Plume goes for Petal Dance, and it does a lot to Jump Bluff considering I double resist it. I can't Leech Seed, but I can put it to sleep. And this is where I have to make a decision whether I want to be greedy or not. I can potentially use an Ice move here, or I could swap in Fortress. I have Swagger on Fortress, and I use Protect at a pretty good time. I'm just going to keep using Protect, because I want Vileplume, oh wow, it's doing a great job, to hit itself in Confusion enough so that when I use Explosion, it'll get knocked out because Vileplume's actually really, 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 really annoying. Next comes out Gengar. So against Gengar, I have to kind of swap here. This isn't a great matchup for me. So I swap into Umbreon and it goes for Curse, which is perfect. Now I have to think for a second, what do I want to do here? I do want to use Curse again, so I swap into Lapras. It goes for Lick, gets a crit, which is annoying, but it's probably going to go for Curse. No, it went for Lick. I really, really want to see Curse. But I also have Attract on Umbreon. I know, very annoying trolley set here. But I mean, it's been three hours. Can you blame me? Anyway, we knock out Gengar. And remember, this Murkrow is not that great. Once again, we're going to set up Confuse Ray and Attract. And just hope Murkrow hits itself in Confusion a bunch of times, which it does. Enough that, ooh, okay. Are we going to get it either to heal? Okay, it's not going to heal. That's perfect. So now we can knock it out in theory. Unfortunately, a tract ends since Umbreon is fainted. But what if I told you this was all part of my strategy? I go for Sing. It's so weird. Why would you go for Sing? You could just knock it out. Well, I set up Parish Song. Now don't forget, Houndoom is still remaining here. The AI will always swap out the last turn of Parish Song, which is good and smart, but also something I can manipulate. And because it was so hard to outspeed Houndoom, I'm able to put it to sleep for the very first time. This is the best situation I've been in 
Cotton Spore unfortunately fails the first time. It hits the second time. Then Leech Seed misses twice. Houndoom stays asleep, thankfully. So I get up Leech Seed. Now out comes Jinx, and I'm hoping Lovely Kiss will outspeed. It does, and it puts it to sleep. Now I send in Haunter. I'm not even going to bother with Curse. I'm going to go with Confuse Ray and Nightshade. I want to get rid of this Houndoom as quickly and safely as possible. And after it hits itself in Confusion, all we have left is a Murkrow that is still asleep, and Nightshade knocks it out. And you can see that reaction is someone who has spent way, way too long on this battle. I mean, look at chat. It's always hard to convey in these videos just how difficult and tedious some of these battles were. But when you see those reactions, you can tell people were pretty hyped. Of course, all this means is that I have to battle Lance, who is supposed to be the toughest trainer. Thankfully, three of his Pokemon are double weak to ice moves, and we do have a couple of those. But there are also Dragonite, who are pretty strong. Gyarados is pretty strong. Charizard and Aerodactyl are pretty strong. So, you know, overall a pretty strong team. Don't forget, it took me three hours to defeat Claire. Will it take me just as long to defeat the champion? I'm going to go with probably. All right. So Lance, do we outspeed? Nope. <laughs> That's not good. All righty. Um, Hyper Beam at least means I get a turn to set up. Of course, Lovely Kiss misses and that's great. I'm actually going to fast forward until we start making progress. I'm going to try out all different types of Pokemon first, and I'll let you know when I start to make a little bit of headway. Well, I have good news and I have bad news. The good news is I make some headway. The bad news is, well, you're about to see what the bad news is. So I'm able to knock out Gyarados with Fortress, but then out comes Dragonite. I don't know which one this Dragonite is, of course, they all have Hyper Beam, which one-shots Umbreon. I send in Jinx, and here's where Ice Punch can come in handy. It's not enough to knock out Dragonite. So, Dragonite, full restore, which Lance has. I get knocked out. So, I'm able to knock out one Pokemon, and Lance used a full restore. But yeah, like always, we've made the smallest bit of progress, and it feels like we are, as the youngster says, light years away from defeating Lance. Only two minutes later though, I get this run. So Hyper Beam has a chance to miss, meaning we can put it to sleep. And then I use Cotton Spore because that means I outspeed now with all my Pokemon. Lance also has full heals. So I have to put Gyarados to sleep multiple times. We have Gyarados now asleep and with Leech Seed, which is really good. Now I can swap an Umbreon. It's staying asleep. I confuse it. And Lance can't heal here, so we actually knock out the Gyarados. Next comes out Dragonite number one. It goes for Hyper Beam, so I'm going to swap into Fortress. It misses with Hyper Beam, which is really annoying. And then it goes for Thunder, which we really don't have a good Pokemon to tank that. Umbreon can tank it okay, but not enough. And then I actually get hit with Hyper Beam, which is not terrible, because that means we can send in Jump Bluff, use Cotton Spore, it has to recharge, put it to sleep, and set up Leech Seed. The trick is to try to manipulate Lance into using Hyper Beam, giving me that extra turn. And I want to see how much Lapras's Ice Beam does to Dragonite, and it eh, does about half, but Dragonite doesn't heal, so we have made it to our third Pokemon, Dragonite number two. Now, I have no idea which Dragonite this is, so I just swap in Fortress, and it uses Hyper Beam. Really, really good. Now I could use Swagger and I say, hey, what the heck? I'll go use Swagger. It hits itself in Confusion. That's pretty good. Then it uses Twister. Unfortunately, that knocks me out. Now I need some pretty good luck here, whether I use Jinx or Lapras. I think about it and I decide to go for Lapras. Unfortunately, it hits me with Hyper Beam, which of course is gonna one shot. Now I can use Cotton Spore. I can use Sleep Powder. Don't forget, it's only a 75% chance. And we don't have a lot of Elixir, so we're running low. But Dragonite is staying asleep. Hopefully this does about half. And it doesn't quite, but Leech Seed finishes it off. And we've actually made it to Pokemon number four for the first time. We've completely bypassed three. Unfortunately, that Pokemon now has super effective attacks against pretty much everything I have remaining. Haunter is pretty frail, so... Yeah, I mean, we're halfway there, 
but like, whoa ho, we don't have a prayer. It's been two hours of battling, and this is the best I can do so far. I've come to rely on the Quick Claw, which is only a 20% chance roughly to activate. That's now necessary, meaning most of my battles end right here at Gyarados. Then I go for Parish Song because like you saw before with Karen, we want to manipulate Lance to switch his Pokemon because if he switches in another Pokemon, then we can use Cotton Spore on the swap in and put it to sleep, which is good. Then we can swap in either Jinx or Lapras and try our hardest, ooh, good crit, to knock it out with ice moves. Now, Charizard is really tough. We have to lose Jinx here. The only thing we can really do for Charizard is we can try to Quick Claw it, but otherwise, Lapras can tank a hit and it can put it to sleep, but that's about all it can do. We can send in Fortress, but Fortress no longer has rollout. It goes for Explosion, does really, really good damage, but not enough. We're able to send in Umbreon and it hits itself in Confusion twice. And due to a crit, we actually do knock out Charizard. Then Gyarados comes out, uses Hyper Beam. We're going to be able to knock it out with Haunter, but then another Dragonite comes out. We can put it to sleep and Lapras actually does with Ice Beam knock it out. So we have made it to the fifth Pokemon and we even get the clutchest Rock Slide miss. Look at my face. I think it's going to happen. I believe. I believe. And of course, my belief was unfounded. It does wake up. It hits Lapras. And I realized that after two hours of battling, the strategies I'm using simply aren't going to work. Something needs to change. And that means, that's right, we need to redo the Elite Four all over again. I spent four hours developing new strategies, and you'll see right off the bat a Pokemon I plan on using. Notice that this is 36 hours into this playthrough. That's real time. That's a timer. I can tell you exactly how long this has taken. And we're all the way back at will. How long is this going to take to get back to Lance? I've already spent over 10 hours on the Elite Four. Try only an hour, including a first try victory versus Karen. Hopefully that means this team is better, but there's only one way to find out. First things first, we need Quick Claw to activate, so this will take a little while. All right, so now here's the strategy I used, and I'm not proud of it. We have Spore because Smeargle learns Sketch. Then we can use Agility, which is better than Cotton Spore since it never misses. But now we have to go for a strat I hate. You see, even with Agility, Gyarados outspeeds us, but because we use Minimize, it misses with Hyper Beam. That's right, I ended up going with Minimize. Now, I have long, long been against using evasion moves. And trust me, if I hadn't spent 37 hours on this challenge, I never would have considered it. But this battle is a really, really good illustration of why evasion moves are so, so cheap. Because they practically don't allow other Pokemon to do anything. Smeargle is basically better jump bluff since it has Leech Seed, Spore, which can't miss, and it can buff its evasion up to maximum. The only thing I need to worry about is running out of power points, and unfortunately, it seems like that might happen in this battle. So I can't put Dragonite back to sleep. So far, Smeargle has knocked out two Pokemon, but another problem is rearing its ugly head. That problem is that we're gonna hit, oh, well, we get hit right here but we're gonna hit level 50. So you might notice that our Jinx is the Pokemon we're no longer using, even though it's pretty good against Lance. I also probably should have used Protect to weaken Dragonite by a little bit, but that's okay. We use Explosion from Fortress and deal a ton of damage to it. Then we can do a little bit of swapping here and there. Since this is the Blizzard Dragonite, Lapras is a good swap in. And since it's going to use Hyper Beam on the Lapras, we can swap in Haunter. Now, Aerodactyl is not great. I don't have Focus Band or anything. I'm just going to faint here. Now, all I can do is tank it with Umbreon. That's how tanky Umbreon is. And we can confuse it. And I can try to swap in Jump Bluff to put it to sleep. 
Unfortunately, it wakes up, uses Rock Slide, which one-shots both Jump Bluff and Lapras. So that's not very good. I also should probably give Experience Share to, uh, let's give it to Jump Bluff, which is level 47. And I also have a PowerPoint up. And the only reusable PowerPoint restoring items are Mystery Berries, and I have a few of those, which should help Smeargle out. But what if I told you as cheap as this strategy was, it still took over an hour to see any sort of progress. Remember, we've already made it to the fifth Pokemon. As it turns out, as cheap as evasion moves are, trying to rely on them for an entire battle just isn't tenable. So things actually needed to be switched up a little bit. We're not going to use Smeargle for the whole battle. It just didn't make sense. So here is the new new strategy. We lead with Jump Bluff and we're trying to get hit with Hyper Beam because that means we can use Endure. For the most part, Endure is just like a bad version of Protect. You can tank any attack, but on one HP. However, for us, Endure is actually better because unlike Protect where it's as if the move missed, here Hyper Beam connects, meaning we get an opportunity to put it to sleep. And in fact, even though we miss, we can use Endure again and get a second chance to put it to sleep. It wakes up quickly, but we get some extremely good luck with a miss after Cotton Spore, and then it goes for Surf, so bad luck. But you see what the strategy is here, and you can see why it's taken me, what, like three hours with evasion moves. I, I want to point that out. I've broken one of my cardinal rules, and it's still taking me forever. All right, so it once again uses full restore really quickly. That's kind of good that he doesn't have full heal. Wasting a full restore there is really good. But man, is it just irritating to do this again and again and again and again and again. And this is just Gyarados. This is just Gyarados. And think about all the percentage moves. Sleep Powder is only 75% and neither of Cotton Spore nor Leech Seed are 100%. Now, once I put it to sleep and set up Leech Seed, then and only then I'm going to go for Minimize and start setting up Minimizes. It turns out it's very, very hard to set up with Smeargle when one move knocks you out. However, if Gyarados has already been slowed down and pre-leech seeded, there's a better chance. All right, Thunder Dragonite comes out next, unfortunately. It wakes up rather quickly and we miss Leech Seed, which really sucks. In fact, we miss Leech Seed multiple times. Three times, in fact. Thankfully, it misses as well, and that's not great for our power points, but Leech Seed actually isn't a move we need a lot of power points for. You only need to use it once per Pokemon. It never goes away. Now we're going to do what we did before, minimize, and just try to hope it doesn't hit. But don't forget, even with maximum evasion, each Hyper Beam has a 30% chance to hit, which is bad in isolation, but over the course of a full run, you're going to get hit with one eventually, right? Well, not this time. Next comes out another Dragonite, and I meant to use Leech Seed here. So we miss a turn of Leech Seed, but that's okay. Now we basically need to get good luck. That's what we need. And we don't. Twister had a 33% chance of hitting, but this is exactly the point. Now, as we do this again, you might be wondering, j -Rose, why not just use Substitute? Substitute would actually be way better than using Minimize in a way because I would get that free hit when it woke up and then I'd be able to put it right back to sleep with Spore. In fact, it's a pretty foolproof strategy. The only issue is that the only Pokemon capable of learning Substitute in Generation 2 is Mr. Mime. And unfortunately for me, Mr. Mime is not available until Kanto, just like Leftovers. If we had Substitute, I would have been able to win a long time ago, but Instead, I just have to battle again and again and again and again, hoping things will go differently. I've spent almost 40 hours on this challenge. It has been brutal. I have used strategies I've never even considered before. Endure, Cotton Spore, all these things. Just never would I thought of using them. And yet, here I am. I decided to stop messing with Sleep Powder because I was missing too often and just go into Smeargle earlier. I don't know why I didn't do that. It's a bit of tunnel vision. But yeah, we put it to sleep, we use Minimize, and we knock out Gyarados. Then we do the exact same thing versus Dragonite. 
We're completely at the mercy of luck here. And we do knock out Dragonite eventually because Lance does have the ability to heal. That's pretty lucky. All right, next comes out Aerodactyl, which is a really scary Pokemon. We only have four more spores left and we put it to sleep. We need to knock out probably four Pokemon with Smeargle. And we knock out Aerodactyl, which is really exciting because Charizard is probably one of the most dangerous. We put it to sleep, we use Leech Seed, and so far things are going great. In fact, we haven't had a single attack against us land yet. And somehow, for the first time, we've made it to the final Dragonite. But we know things aren't going to be easy here because we've run out of Spore, we've run out of Minimize, Sure, we put it to sleep. Sure, we use Leech Seed, but it would only take one attack for this entire battle to turn. Dragonite does have Outrage, and it keeps going for it, and eventually it'll hit. Oh, wait. It's going to hit itself in confusion. We did it. We did it. I can't believe it. We did it. Oh, that's really good. You'll notice that I have a bit of a muted celebration this time, because as happy as I am that we finally beat Lance, a, I know that red will be even tougher, but B, I did have to break an unofficial rule that I've tried to use for every single challenge. Now, some of you have much better memories about my videos than I do, but I think Feebas was the only time I used evasion moves. And so to use them again, didn't feel great, but hey, we didn't have any other options and this took a really long time. I think this is a well-earned victory. Normally, this is the point where I would talk about all the Kanto Gym Leaders, but unfortunately, this video is lasting far too long. So let me just say that the Kanto Gym Leaders weren't nearly as difficult as their Johto counterparts or the Elite Four, and I'm going to skip right on ahead and show you the battle with the final trainer, Red. Before I do, this challenge has taken me 139 in-game hours but probably more importantly, 46, almost 46, real world hours. This is probably the longest I've ever spent on a challenge. It's been tons of fun and brutally difficult, and I'm sure Red will be no exception. So to lead off against Pikachu, I have a Rhydon. Pikachu inexplicably goes for quick attack, and somehow Earthquake from level 46 Rhydon knocks out Pikachu. Next comes out Espeon. So Espeon, remember Umbreon? Well, it still hasn't hit level 50 yet. All Espeon can do versus Umbreon is use Swift. And remember I talked about Toxic way back when? Well, we beat Janine, so we have Toxic, meaning Umbreon can be its trolliest self. And we even have Leftovers Recovery. I knew a full restore was coming, so I went for Toxic. That was pretty smart and unlike me normally, and due to Leftover's recovery, I'm actually doing quite, quite well. I don't know if Umbreon will be able to knock out Espeon without getting some Hitting in Confusion luck, and Hitting in Confusion luck I get. Unfortunately, I do not preempt the second use of a full restore, and that might hurt. Again, we're gonna have to speed things up a little bit because, oh my gosh, did this take a really long time. But at the end of the day, Espeon did a lot of damage to me, but Umbreon was successful. Two down for red, zero for me. Next comes out Snorlax, and fun fact about Snorlax, it actually can't do anything to a ghost type Pokemon. And so we can safely switch in Haunter, put it to sleep if we want to, and use Curse. Red's team shockingly has some pretty bad movesets, and we need to use Confuse Ray because if Snorlax wakes up, it's gonna go for rest. So what I might want to do is swap in Rhydon because Snorlax is not very effective versus Rhydon and I can go for Tail Whip so either Earthquake does more or hitting itself in Confusion does more. Perfect. Now out comes Venusaur and Venusaur is another Pokemon that is fairly easy to cheese because its best move is Solar Beam, which it goes for. And Jump Bluff in this generation well, in any generation it tanks it, but in this generation can put it to sleep with Sleep Powder. I can't just use Smeargle here because already it's basically at the level cap, so that's why we have to use Jump Bluff. Now we can swap in Haunter, and we can go for Curse. I might go for Destiny Bond. Eh, I go for Curse. 
Unfortunately, because an even number of HP, I knock myself out, and then I go for Cotton Spore. Because why the heck not? Making it slower is always good. Curse is slowly taking away HP. I wish Leech Heed were effective against Venusaur. I get hit by another Solar Beam, which sucks, and it looks like this battle isn't going to go too well for me. I swap an Umbreon because I realize I can gain back a little bit of HP, but then I make a mistake. I protect a turn too early, meaning I'll need to get the 50% chance of a double protect to not faint a Solar Beam, and I get it. Really good luck there. And how many Pokemon are left? Just two more. Charizard is one of them, but Charizard, remember, is pretty good. Goes for Flamethrower and bye-bye Umbreon. Now, this Lantern is something I've been planning on using for a really long time, and it really hasn't had much use yet. But Charizard goes for Fire Spin, meaning we can paralyze it and then use Surf. Flamethrower is far more effective. Now, in Crystal version, we would have Thunderbolt, but here we have to go for Surf or Spark. But I opt to do neither and go for Confuse Ray because, hey, you know what's stronger than my Pokemon? Charizard itself. Now I'm hoping Lapras will actually be able to knock it out, and that crit may have mattered. Now the final Pokemon is Blastoise, and I realize something. Blastoise really doesn't have anything good versus Lapras. So I put it to sleep, I use Parasong, and look at that facial expression. I'm starting to realize that I have beaten this challenge. Not only have I beaten this challenge, I got a first try victory versus Red. I can't believe it. <laughs> oh, well, go figure, right? Sometimes things have a weird way of working out. Turns out we had the absolute perfect strategy versus red. It took just over 46 hours to do this, but we were able to defeat all of Pokemon gold and silver when our opponents had level 100 Pokemon with us never going over level 50. If you like this video, let me know because this was part of a trilogy. And if you want to see the most difficult and probably best challenge of the trilogy, then show this video some love. So I know you guys want to see more until then. I have lots more videos to make. Thank you guys so, so much for watching as always. Take care.